deepest theological letter, and if chapter 8 is the spiritual emphasis, then chapter 12 is the practical emphasis. And last week, Reverend Mingle shared a great sermon about changing lives, about being like Jesus, and using the Good Samaritan as an example for us to go and do likewise. And so I want to pick up on that theme of considering what changes are taking place in us and look at these first two verses in chapter 12 that tell us that we need to change transforming from the inside out. So listen to God's word to you. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we open your word and we open this brief text and consider all the application it has for us in our lives. And so impute in each of us that part of the truth with which we can take away in, from this sanctuary and apply in our lives. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I hear the word transform, I go back to my youth and I think about those big boxes on telephone poles, those rectangular or square boxes. And in fact, I saw one explode one time, which was very exciting for a six-year-old at the time. It really transformed. <laughs> but then I started thinking about that word, transform, and I went back to when our children were young, particularly our son, so you're talking 20, 25 years ago, and how he used to play with those Hasbro toys. Remember those little things that would transform from a car to a robot? And he, we still have some of those in a box somewhere. So then I started thinking a, a little bit more recently, going back to grandchild age, so about five or six years ago, and I was thinking about that new movie that came out in 2007 called Transformers. Do you remember that? I'm sure if you have grandchildren and children, you know about Transformers, because we heard about this one Transformer every day that we had our grandson, and it was fascinating to think about what was taking place in this Hollywood-rich movie with such names as Optimus Prime, Megatron, Bumblebee, Starscream, and Ironhide. <laughs> names that a six-year-old will know quite well by heart, and in fact, it's so popular that there are ads now out for the Fourquill, not Sequel, Fourquill, Transformers 4, for the summer of 2014. It's already being promoted. The one that was always the most favorite was that when the new model, the new design of the Camaro came out, the, the, this bright yellow muscle car would turn into Bumblebee who would talk to you through using popular phrases in the radio of the car. Well, I often think about all those transformer images and then I read this passage and I thought, what does this mean when you read that you and I need to be transformed? And of course I'm not talking about some computer animation from one shape to another, but the transformation of men and women who are trying to be faithful to this scripture text. What's it mean? 
There are two uses of this word in the New Testament that might give us a clue. One is back in, in Mark 9, verse 2, the transfiguration of Jesus, same root word. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And then if you go to another letter of Paul, the second Corinthians letter in, in verse um, 3, verse 318, it describes the believer's ability to be transformed in God's likeness by beholding God's glory. And it says, And all of us with unveiled faces seeing the glory of God as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Now, in both of these cases, transformation involves a complete, radical recentering of the self. And at the very least, both of these transformations show an observable Change. Change. Not a word in good favor in most mainline churches. However, as much as we don't even like to hear that word, our entire Christian faith is about not only observable change, but radical change. Change from law to gospel from sin to forgiveness, from commandment to grace, from fear to love, from Passover to communion, from death to eternal life. That's radical change. In fact, that's the same thought behind the word conversion is a radical change. Conversion literally means you're going in one direction and you convert and go in a 180 degree different direction. Now this is not a new concept. It's apparently a real life human concept popular today. Even though you hear that there's a lot of religious apathy in our world and in our culture, and even though you hear of a, a significant increase in the number of nuns, remember I explained that a few weeks ago? When you're filling out a form and it says religious affiliation, you put none. That's a huge increase in, in people from about 5% to 15% in 20 years in our culture. None. No religious affiliation at all. Even though we hear that's the case, there is also a very real desire in the world around us and within our culture of men and women who want to seek a deeper and more meaningful spirituality to be transformed, not temporarily, not as a one-time high or as a facade of religious stupor, but deep down to the innermost part of their souls to find God, to know God, to experience God, and to love God. That is real in our culture today. And in our text, in these two short verses, Paul offers us two perspectives of change. The first has to do with the body, the second has to do with the mind. The first action speaks of an offering and the second deals with transformation. The first leads to true worship, and the second leads to the will of God. And so let's see just briefly what we might understand and take away from this text today. Paul tells us in verse 1, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Now just about every commentator that you read will condense these thoughts into one word. And that word will be dedication. Some kind of determined focus that is dedicated. The dedication, Morgan, I use you as an example to play such a beautiful flute. I mean the years of dedication that she's given to our benefit. Dedication 
He begins with a very unusual word, though. Unexpected, I think. And it says, to present your bodies. Did you catch that? This is sacrificial language. This is language which you and I aren't familiar with, but those people hearing it in first century Christianity would be very familiar with the language of sacrifice. It's liturgical language which invokes some kind of dedicating to, on the altar. It's used by Paul here as he's presenting us to be an acceptable dedicated offer, an acceptable worship to God. Paul is saying that each one of us needs to present ourselves, our physical bodies, our dedicated beings, our everyday living, offering praise and worship to Almighty God. Eugene Peterson puts it in the message in a wonderful modern day language. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you, take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God has done for you is the best thing that you can do for Him. I like Leonard Sweet's comment that he says, God is not the, in the business of dead sacrifices. God is in the business of living sacrifices, which means people who dedicate their entire lives to serving God by bettering humanity and building a better world. Just exactly what you prayed about, Juanita, in the prayer for the offering. This kind of dedication encourages you and me to true worship. Not just on Sundays, but taking your everyday life and placing each activity, all the ordinary day-to-day -day routine activities, and placing them before God with a prayer on your lips and with thanksgiving in your hearts. Letting God use your hands to bless someone else. So that's verse 1. Presenting yourself as a living sacrifice every day. But there's more in this text here in helping us understand how we should change. And it's in verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, Paul says, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. In his book, The, the Disciple-Making Church, Glenn MacDonald says, the English words conform and transform translate verbs from very different Greek roots. Conform is derived from the noun schema, which is to the Greeks referring to those external, ever-changing appearances that we have. Our schema is, can, can be changed by something as simple as a change in our hairstyle, or perhaps a new set of clothing. That's a change in schema, and that's what it means to change on the outside. That's part of what conforming is. Something on the outside of you is conforming to something else. Transform, on the other hand, derives from a completely different Greek word, morph. Morph, which speaks of a person's unchanging true identity. According to this verse, authentic spiritual change is not a matter of acquiring some new habits or some cosmetic altercations. We are called to be transformed in the very core of our being, changed on the inside, deep down in the innermost part of our soul. Paul's telling us as Christians to avoid what is conforming, that is just some kind of change on the outside, and consider the inside of the of your heart and of your person. Again, go to Eugene Peterson. He has wonderful words. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it 
without even thinking. And I even found in the J.B. Phillips translation another interesting application. This is an old translation that says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. That's conforming. So how are we transformed? By the renewing of your mind. That is what we call being changed from the inside out. Seeing life through the lens of faith, through a mind so steeped in God's Word. And that's through daily reading of God's Word. So immersed in God's grace. And that's through daily prayer between you and God. And through a mind that is so overwhelmed by God's steadfast love. And that is through you making some part of every day a worship experience. With those three applications, Paul says, then we will be able to discern what is the will of God. What is good, acceptable, and perfect. How do we know when we are transforming from the inside out? Those who are conformed to the world are focused on the rewards of a material world. The transformed are focused on the ministry that the Spirit has given them. Those who are conformed seek a personal promotion. Those who are transformed seek a meaningful ministry. Those who are conformed seek more stuff. Those who are transformed seek the right stuff, the good, acceptable, and perfect. The conformed seek the comfort of the flesh. The transformed seek the renewal of the mind. The conformed invest in the temporal and the transformed invest in that which is eternal. Doing so by proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In the changed life that Jesus has given you through offering you salvation by his being on the cross and being raised from the dead. Changed lives just like Jesus. Going and doing likewise as Ted said last week. Highland has a motto, and the motto is people following Jesus. But I'd like you to consider adding a little icing to the cake there and have Highlanders. People following Jesus, transformed from the inside out. Amen.